Hey everybody, it's Ryan from Cataclysm Now, and uh, tonight I will be sharing my final thoughts about the, uh, the Deadly Woods, The Battle of the Bulge, uh, published by Revolution Games and designed by none other uh, than Ted Racer. Now, I'm no expert in bulge games. Uh, I've only played two, um, including this one, the other one being uh, the most recent title from Worthington Publishing. But uh, I'll try to judge it um, in context to, to what I know about other bulge games, and also obviously on its its own merits. Um, but as I was playing the game and also reading a, um, a recent volume um, by Anthony Beaver, Ardennes 44, um, single volume, relatively short, kind of an introductory, I had read um, another volume years ago. But anyway, long story short, <clears throat> It's interesting that the Battle of the Bulge is one of the most gamed um, conflicts, uh, especially the Second World War, but I think broadly across the hobby, there's a litany of Bulge games. Everyone almost has its spin or take on it. Um, and Gettysburg also falls into that same example, or that same like category of just games that a lot of designers do. Of course, they bring up their own spin and their own biases and their interpretation of the campaign. But <clears throat> it's also just interesting. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this bulge is well. I, I know why it was adapted. It's always adapted. It's a, it's a period of high drama. I mean, the narrative is just is sort of leaping off the map or leaping leaping off the page, so to speak. And you've got. An enemy for on paper for all intents and purposes is finished, it's down and out, uh, at least on the Merrick or the Allied side on the Western Front, waiting for the thaw. We have a big push planned in March, and we're just resting our laurels and tidying up our supply lines, our logistics, and getting ready for that push. And then out of nowhere, here come the Germans <laughs> launching um, a substantial offensive in the Ardennes Forest. Ironic given that uh, they've done it. I think three other times before that. They did it in 40, they did it in 1914, and they also did it in 1870. So, <clears throat> is anybody actually surprised about that? I guess I, I, I'm not, but uh, hindsight's 2020. Anyway, what's interesting about the, the gaming the bulge, though, um, is it's almost futile because even within the victory conditions of the different titles. Now, again, I'm, not, I'm no expert in bulge games, but a lot of them only cover the, you know, the first, you know, seven days of the offensive. It starts on the 16th and goes through, you know, the 24th or 25th, uh, the apex of the, the German advance. And if the Germans haven't achieved their victory, then, yep, oh well, they, they, they lose. Um, but they have achieved their victory, and that's usually crossing armor across the Meuse, um, or getting, getting a certain number of uh, steps across the Meuse, and it's like, voila, the Germans have won. And I think about how does that fundamentally, fundamentally change the trajectory of the war? Like, we don't know what happens after those armored units cross the Meuse. Like, do you take Antwerp? Like, does that fracture the Allied alliance? And so, in a lot of ways, the bulge games have to be very granular and tactical, and in a way, arbitrary, because... I think in many ways the operation was doomed from the beginning. I mean, the Hitler's high command thought as much. There was a gross misappropriation of resources, tanks and armor, uh, uh, and fuel that should have been used for the defense of East Prussia. Which is ironic also because the, the foot soldier, especially when the SS, they interpreted it as a... Um, as a repeat of the successes of 1940, and <clears throat> they were much more emotionally invested and thought that this was uh, a real chance, um, you know, to split the Allied army, seize Antwerp, and and essentially win the war in the West. Which, of course, uh, hindsight is <laughs> outlandish, but even at the time, um, they didn't stand a snowball's chance in hell. <coughs> Excuse me, pun intended. Um, in terms of sort of stopping uh, the march of the armies in the West, certainly doing nothing to prevent the inevitability of the collapse uh, in the East. And what I mean inevitability, I mean at this point in the war. 
early 45, or late 44, early 45. Anyway, how does that relate to Ted Racer's um, The Deadly Woods? Well, first and foremost, it the scale of it goes beyond just the German offensive, which petered out <coughs> around Christmas. It factors in the following three weeks. So the um, game actually ends on January 15th, which is when the majority of the bulge have been flattened at that point. It didn't get completely flattened until late January, which means the victory conditions included in this is essentially preventing the Germans from seizing X amount of victory cities. And if the Allies do that, then, you know, the Germans lose. And if they're able to accomplish that, essentially what it is, is kind of like uh, Mark Simonich's um, Normandy 44. Victory is judged by what the ally, if you can exceed what the allies did historically, then that, that's considered victory. Now, the Germans can win victory earlier than that. They can cross, I think it's like seven or eight steps of armor across the Meuse or they can hold five victory cities. <coughs> and because of the scale that's been chosen, so not only scale-wise does it cover uh, the, a lot more time than most bulge games, um, it also covers more territory. So you do, you have Liège, you have obviously saint Vic, you've got Bastogne, um, but it actually includes Luxembourg City, where, it, uh, where Bradley's headquarters was located. And it actually has Sedan, which is where the Germans crossed in, uh, the Meuse in 1940. And all these victory hexes do provide um, sort of operational latitude for the Germans. So they don't necessarily have to go straight forward and, you know, cross the Meuse where they tried to, at, like, Denant or yeah, Liège, which is interesting. Um, it, it's a bit, a bit a historical given that... Um, Hitler forbade any like deviation from the operational plan in order to cross the Meuse and, and hit Antwerp. So even though the Allies were really worried that Luxembourg City was a target or even Liège was a target, they never were. But I guess for <coughs> excuse me, for the interest of um, fog of war, the, the, those objectives are included in there. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Um, also, it's a 22 by 34 map. Um, which isn't wild in its own right, but the fact that it is also mostly regimental in scale. Um, there's, comp, there's the German equivalent, the comp, uh, Kampfgruppe, but it is regimental in scale, but also 22 by 34. So it has a small footprint, but you have a granular, um, a, gran a sense of the granular it's basically comparable to Arden 44 in that way, but Arden 44 is a 222 by 34 map, so it's, you know, it's got a bigger footprint and it's spread out across more terrain. But it, it never feels um, congested or stuffy because there are, there are rather liberal stacking loads for um, the Deadly Woods. Um, it's basically an entire division can stack plus one additional. So I think the 101st is four regiments, if I remember. If not, it's three. Um, but then you have, can have one more regiment of another division stacked with it. So that gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of do you want to pile all your <clears throat> regiments together in one division in defense, of, you know, Bastogne or a crossroad or whatnot, but then you lack the, um, the, the coverage uh, to throw down zones of control to prevent the movement of uh, German forces. Westward. <clears throat> so those are the the, large, the 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 initial things that are sort of different about it is the the the, the time scale, uh, the size, and the, and the footprint. But the next big thing that is sort of separates it from uh, most of the other bulge games, and and, and, a, and from a lot of uh, operational games as well, is it features the chip pull mechanism. Now, don't be fooled by the Deadly Woods. It is essentially a member of the Dark Series. And the Dark Series is, for those of you who are not familiar, the Dark Series um, 
which admittedly I haven't played any. <laughs> I have the Dark Sands and I have the Dark Valley, but they sit on my Shaman shelf and I promised myself I'm gonna get the Dark Valley, I think sometime this year. But they're essentially, they're governed by chip pull mechanism, which is folds in um, movement, combat, and it can fold in other player phases into a um, into a, an unpredictable order. So instead of always going through, you go, I go, I know I'm going to move, and then I know and move in an attack, and you're going to move in an attack. These chits are thrown into a, an opaque cup, and you pull, and whoever's pulled gets to do that particular action. Now, that can vary, and not having played the Dark Valley or the Dark Sands, I imagine it varies differently in terms of what actions are available, how many you have. So essentially, the dead, the Deadly Woods is a dark adaptation. It's just not called the Dark Woods because <clears throat> I think they're saving the, the dark moniker for uh, GMT games, which uh, Dark Summer just came out. I'm seeing a lot of good press and coverage for that. And I think uh, it shares, obviously shares a lot with this. Um, and now, I'm really, uh, I, now that I've played this, I'm more apt <coughs> to get Valley and Sands on the table because it's a really intuitive system. It actually, it plays really well um, solo. Uh, and I do most of my wargaming solo. Part of that is for COVID or was for COVID. I mean, it doesn't really matter now since um, I'm vaccinated. And, uh, you know, if there were more people to play with, I would be playing with. Um, and, and that's a whole other topic. I should probably talk about it at some point at length in terms of... Um, the, the value of solitaire versus competitive person-to-person um, -person play. Anyway, it works well with solo because you just don't know who's going to go next. You don't even know what act you're, you're really confined to the particular action. Now you'll know what, what chits are available in the cup and you can predict or, or count on what your next move may be, but it is the chip pull system, and and that has a lot of benefits, not only just for the solitaire, but like I indicated before, it folds in some of the, the traditional player phases. So a lot of games have, um, I mean, this game has um, replacements, so you do have replacements, and uh, each side has uh, a, a certain amount. Obviously, historically, the allies have more as the campaign goes on. They can... Um, up steps for particular regiments, but <clears throat> another uh, the reinforcements those are chits that go into the cup. So you don't know instead of waiting for the particular reinforcement phase where you know that you know the hundred first or the eighty second or some more SS Panzer divisions are going to come on, you you don't know when they're going to come on, and then that's dictated by chit pull. In addition to that. Um, at least for the Germans, and I, this was super clever, and I was I was really impressed by this. Um, the supply rules are asymmetric uh, between the Americans and the Germans. The Americans, you basically calculate supply normally, you as you would most other games, like when moving, at the time of combat, at the time of reinforcements, at the time of replacements, etc. The Germans, at least for movement and combat. The uh, supplies only check when the chit is pulled. So Germans are the Germans are free to roam and move and conduct themselves free of traditional supply rules um, until the next their their next supply chit is pulled. So there's a press your luck element to that, where if you need to circumvent a um, you know an ally stronghold or a particular crossroad is giving the Germans a, uh, trouble, they can attempt to circumvent that and not necessarily have to worry about supply in that moment. But should they be caught <clears throat> out of supply when that shit is pulled, I mean, that's obviously an issue. But what's doubly an issue is that they cannot be considered in supply until the next supply chip is pulled, which is fantastic. And uh, it's another reason why I, I, I'm impressed with the 
the application of the chip pull mechanism is that it folds in um, these certain design features that are abstracted through the, the, the chip pull. So in the supply case, the Germans only have a finite amount of fuel, essentially, to, to, to push their panzer divisions forward. So one, one way to reflect that are the supply rules that I've mentioned. So if they are, if they move and they are out of supply, they don't have fuel until fuel arrives when they pull the next chip. So even if they pull themselves into supply, which we traditionally calculate, um, you know, being able to trace a, um, you know, a, a line of supply, a line of communication back to a board edge, doesn't matter. Fuel's not available. Um, which, which is incredibly clever. Another way to do that is just to reduce the amount of chits or the type of chits they have going forwards by the end of the game. They start at the beginning of the game, they have things like all units can move, um, can move and fight, or all the units of the 5th Panzer or the 6th Panzer, etc., because they're divided historically by their army boundaries. They can move <clears throat> and, do a lot, and, and do a lot, but as the game wears on, those capabilities are degraded. And that's another thing that, um, at first when I was reading the rules, I saw that there was no, um, there's no, there's no, there's no weather, there's no air power, which is a little alien, even for someone who hasn't played a lot of bulge games. Uh, uh, Worthington had bowl, had weather rules. I haven't perused the Ardennes 44, but I imagine that there are kind of like Normandy 44 and Feel free to comment and correct me, but it, that, that there are air assets that you can spend to have column shifts or, or something like that. And that's probably contingent on weather. <clears throat> Obviously, the more overcast and cloudy, the less um, air assets there are. No air assets in this. Ah, like none at all. You're no mention of weather. Um, which I, I thought was, was interesting. And, and at first I thought it was an oversight or something he just, Ted didn't want to include in the design. But there's artillery, um, and we'll get to artillery, I'll mention artillery here in a second. Um, there's artillery that can be spent in particular combat. So it's not that like he had jettisoned that idea completely. And so I thought, it was an oversight, it was a mild criticism I had, but you know, every design, you know, it's not perfect or not to your liking. But um, I stumbled on a, uh, a Board Game Geek thread about that, and it, it it did put it into perspective in terms of instead of having the rules overhead for, for rolling for weather or having variable weather um, and, and having extra counters for, for aircraft when they're available, etc., that was just was baked into it. The assumption is that the weather that because because of the scale of the campaign, because it is that whole month, as opposed to the bad weather only covering the first week, that the weather will clear, allied air power will be applied, um, you know, columns of tanks are being attacked, fuel is being limited, and, and, and the the overwhelming allied air power is being reflected in the limited number of the chit, uh, chits that the Germans have going forward. So it's it, it's not an in-your-face rule. It's not like, oh, I know that I'm applying um, air power and, and you know, I see it working for me. It, it is working in the background, you know. It, it's coding in the background where, you know, this next turn we've lost, you know, a couple of the Germans have lost a couple of chits because, um, you know, they don't explain it, but they've lost those ch chits. They can only move so much now because, well, the allies are hammering them uh, from the skies. So, um, I can't remember if he mentions that in the designer notes. I, his, his designer notes are really well written, um, and they explain a lot of the design decisions. I can't remember if he explained that one specifically. But, that being said, all these elements sort of uh, fit together. Um, now, it being a bulge game, you still have the traditional, you know, setup where there is a preponderance of German ordnance and material and they break through a, um, a, 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 a not well guarded um, area of the Ardennes and you've got green units, you have the 106th which is overrun, you have 
just these savage rear guard actions and these desperate struggles to hold these crossroads and to hold up the Germans. And so the Germans have the best bet of winning in the beginning, or at least seizing the most territory. And if they can keep it, um, then they can win the game in the end. <clears throat> so there's still those traditional elements of the bulge game. You also have um, the terrain. that I really liked the variations of different types of terrain in the game. <coughs> of everything from clear uh, to light woods to normal woods uh, to forest. Uh, there are this rough terrain, which is kind of ridges, uh, which provide column shifts, uh, and then there's towns, and there's villages, uh, and then there's rivers and bridges, and is it like armored zones that control don't extend into woods or forests, they can actually can't pass through forests, and there's all these um, different ways that the that the terrain rules interact, and with, and with the roads too, and that that's sort of the quint a quintessential feature of any bulge game is the, the congestion of roads, finding the path of least resistance along the roads. And that's why I played two solo games. Uh, the first one, the Germans just ran roughshod um, over the Allies were able to capture enough victory cities um, ju just to, to call it. Um, but in the second one, I had individual regiments who, who had been cut off and surrounded. Um, and they were able, through mostly bad tie rolls uh, on the CRT for the Germans, but they were able to hold up entire divisions for, for a turn, just like a day or two, because they're holding these crossroads. Because, you know, they, they were, in, a, they were in, a, in a disadvantageous place for the Germans. You know, even though they've been cut off, they had to, the Germans had to pass through this particular town or this particular crossroads. Um, and, and that, and, and that's, that historical fact is well represented in this design. And in fact, I think it's represented in most designs, but especially in this one. Um, <clears throat> so I, I appreciated the, the variety of terrain and how that informed your, um, or at least my, um, tactical choices in terms of where to move and where to attack and where to sit and defend. Um, so yeah, there's also, even though the chip pull system is sort of the, the engine or the impetus that drives all the action, there is a lot of chrome in the game. Um, the chrome, which is fantastic, which could sort of not only drives historical outcomes, but in that way drives, um, drives a narrative. Um, so one of them, um, is divisional integrity because each division is broken down into its constituent regiments uh, or Kampfgruppe for the Germans, depending. Um, at least for the Americans when they're on the attack and the defense, each regiment that's participating in an attack has to be within three hexes of um, a nut of its sibling. Um, regiment, so a regiment of its own division, um, it has to do that, it has to be within three hexes to not suffer um, uh, a um, negative column shift. So if you have a two to one attack, but that regiment isn't within three hexes of another regiment from its division, then it suffers, uh, then the two to one, the one to one. And the reasons for that are obvious. They, we, they, you, his, just for command control, you wouldn't want, you know, if, if you have four regiments in a division, you wouldn't want to space them out like 10, 15, 20 miles from each other. Because each hex in this game is about three miles. So, you know, it reasonably stands that each regiment, so, but you can string them out. So, you know, you could have, you know, a, a division strung out across like 36 miles, um, but at least each one was within three of each other. So that, that's a nice bit of chrome. There's um, everything from Operation Greif, uh, which is the 150th Brigade donning American um, uh, uniforms, speaking English, uh, painting their tanks to look like Shermans rather terribly. They that fooled uh, many people. There's um, Piper's K-1 
capture of a fuel depot in the second term. Um, there's delay markers, which can't move. They have a minuscule um, defense um, factor. I think it's just one, but it can hold up uh, German um, German advances. So that represents the small rear guard actions. You have engineer assets. You just have a litany of things. You have artillery assets, um, which for the Americans, the artillery assets can be moved, can be used every action round, so not every turn, every action round. So uh, they they are limited to um, core. So each core has their own um, artillery asset, but it can be used in attack or defense for an action round, and then can be used again and. That lines up historically in terms of the defense of the northern shoulder of the uh, of the bulge, um, or I think it's called Elsenborn. Can't remember. Anyway, um, while the Germans can only use it once per turn, so even that shows a, a different balance between um, artillery parity, so to speak. But all of those elements sort of build this. Um, this design that focuses on gameplay decisions it does have a bit of chrome. Um, and I guess my, my only minor quibble is that because of the preponderance of chrome, I wish the revolution had shipped a sort of a player aid. I, I know that there's a player aid um, that accomplishes the same thing, say in the Dark Valley. I've looked through the components for that enough. It sort of gives you a blow by blow that like, hey, in turn one, you know, these special cases apply. And there are exceptions to the rule. So you may have the, the broad strokes down, but just to remind you, you have to do this, this, this turn, this, this turn, this, this turn, etc. No such thing here. Um, they, I, I, there are, there are, they do exist, but they've been user created um, on Board Game Geek. Um, so I advise that if you get this game and play it, go and download that and print it out and put it in here. I do wish it had been printed off and put in. Um, I imagine that has something to do with um, production costs. I, I, I get, I, I don't know much about wargaming production and how long it takes to develop and produce, etc. Um, I have intimations about how that process is done, but um, I, I figure it has something to do with the keep, uh, to keep the cost down. Uh, and if that's the case, then I'm happy to do the extra legwork. It's, um, it's not that big of a deal. Um, also included with that is an um, uh, extended um, example of play, not included in the game. Um, but it is available on Revolution's website, so... Um, you know, maybe save a couple of trees, but I'm, I'm a really tacked out person. I, I like everything in the box. I like everything to be uh, presented because um, I haven't gotten into Vassal uh, or Tabletop Simulator or any of that, and I don't really plan to um, at this time. But but yeah, um, that's the Deadwood Woods uh, Battle of Bulge. Um, I think it's it's in this, it's a it's a clever title. Um, it's well designed. It seeks out. I mean, Ted actually lays out in his designer notes. It seeks out to accomplish um, sort of a low rules overhead um, that emphasizes the chip pull and making decisions based off of what you pull and trying to achieve your operational objectives. Folding as much as the design as it can into the chip pool, so you don't have extra phases or extra steps. Um, I don't know if I, yeah, I, I think I mentioned this before, but um, also the reinforcements when they come in, um, just elements like that. I, I really appreciate. So it, it, in a way, it's it's streamlined, but with some of the extra package of the Chrome, which again. I don't find it's burdensome to play because I'm 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 really narrative driven and I um, like to ground myself in the history as to why um, the design decisions are made. So if I know some of the history around it, I'd be like, okay, so this rule is simulating X or it's representing Y, um, then, then it sticks in my mind a little more. I think potentially for <coughs> any gamers who 
come to the deadly woods with, without knowing anything about the Battle of Bulge, um, they'll probably have time, a hard time picking it up. But I had a feeling that the crowd that's attracted to this knows enough about the Battle of Bulge that those, um, those design decisions will stick. Um, in terms of complexity, again, without having a lot of uh, experience with Bulge games, I imagine it, um, it's obviously, it's more, I can, I can say it's more complicated than, um, more complex than, uh, Worthington's Battle of the Bulge game that just recently came out. But, um, it's probably a notch under, um, the Simonage title, uh, which I do have, and I'll, I'll play at some point. I'm a little bulged out right now. I didn't mean to take this detour <laughs> into <coughs> Battle of the Bulge titles. Um, so I, I'd say it, it's medium complexity, um, but uh, I don't. It's not much more I can say about it. Uh, if you're familiar with the Dark series, you'll love it. Um, if you already have your dream Battle of the Bulge game, I don't know if this will do much. But if you're like me and you wanted something with a small footprint, um, that was Chip Pool. Um, so it sort of streamlined a lot of the um, mechanisms. Um, and then you just want another Ted Racer design. Um, it's hard to complain here. So I recommend uh, The Deadly Woods, uh, Battle of the Bulge, by, um, or um, designed by uh, Ted Racer and published by Revolution Games. So uh, thanks for sticking around and listening to me ramble, uh, kind of a review, final thoughts, and uh, we'll uh, catch you next time.